sephirot of, of absolute enlightened consciousness. Then it comes down to chokmah, wisdom, and bina, understanding, which, which nestle below it. Each of these represents a different quality of the divine nature. And then below that you have chokmah, uh, sorry, um, hased, compassion, and uh, givura, judgment or discernment. These represent more the heart area and feeling and <clears throat> um, are more you know, particular to our emotional life and our need to have compassion, but also to balance that with judgment. Um, so, yes, I have compassion on you know, um, <clears throat> the, the situation in Britain, the crisis of Brexit, <clears throat> and I've developed my gavura, my discernment, and my judgment enough to, to realise that it's terrible, and therefore I speak out strongly against it. Um, then we come to Tifera, which is the balance of beauty, and then Netzach, victory, which is achievement, which is when we finally get Brexit stopped. That will be the Netzach moment. Um, and then we come to Hod, which is the trembling of joy, having achieved the victory. Um, <clears throat> and then there's Yesod, which is the, the generative power that then flows into us, having achieved that victory against Brexit. And, and getting back into the universal flow of nations, like genuinely deserving our place, in the United Nations, in the European Union. You know, it's like we have to run really, really fast just to get back where we started from. A bit like Odysseus, really, poor man, you know, had to go all that way just to get back to Penelope, his true love. And then we come to Malkut, which is the kingdom, which is our manifestation, the practical stuff we can do after we've stopped Brexit, how we can then, you know, feed the poor, stop these food banks, get people you know, totally transform or get rid of universal credit so everyone has enough to eat and doesn't starve to death. Start taxing the super wealthy, you know. Chase up all the offshore money that, that Ritz owners and Daily Telegraph people, you know, are, are just conning the British people over. Um, <clears throat> channel the money that's going into a new range of nuclear weapons into something that people actually need and, and, and could do with, like proper schools and... and fund the medical service of the NHS so that it deals with preventative and alternative and complementary medicine as well as hugely expensive machines and drugs and pills and so on. Let's, let's keep people well rather than just treating them when they're you know, sick and dying. So there's huge amounts of things to be done. <clears throat> that, that's Melkut. That's what comes after we stop Brexit and have that victory. Okay, that's an example of the Kabbalah being used at a particular um, focus point about Brexit. Um, this whole system of the Sephirot, the ten levels of, of the divine, was, was transmitted through the Zohar, which Moses and Leon wrote down. <clears throat> now, there's a controversy among Jewish scholars. Gershom Shalom said he didn't, he didn't get this from any ancient sources. He made it up. Um, Abraham Tishbe, another scholar in Jerusalem, <clears throat> had the same view, but they differed as to the dates. But the tradition is that he received this as an oral transmission. The Kabbalah means oral transmission, like I'm doing now. And that it was transmitted from sage to sage to sage to sage, all the way back to Moses. And that what I've just explained, these Sephiroth, this is what Moses saw in the burning bush. This was the insight moment, the incredible revelation Moses had on the top of the mountain, uh, you know, seeing the burning bush. And, and He'd been raised as an Egyptian sage. He knew all the wisdom of the Egyptians. He was now learning the wisdom of his desert forebears, the Hebrews. He had this enlightenment moment when he saw that, hey, it's the same thing. you know. And he saw these levels, which is the burning bush. Now that's the tradition. <clears throat> um, and before that, it had come down from Abraham and you know, back into the, the depths of prehistoric Paleolithic shamanism of the origin of the Hamito-Semitic peoples and their Indo-European cousins. It goes back ultimately to the same root as the Druid Ogham traditions and the runic traditions of Odin and the Sanskrit traditions of, of the, the Vedic rishis. If you trace it all back, it, goes, it has to go to a common source, which I've written about and exposed or analysed in the Kabbalah runes. Um, so, <clears throat> Moses de Leon, I think, was a recipient of an oral tradition. I, I challenge Gershom Sholem and his school 
because the trouble is they're just scholars who only study written sources. They're not aware of the, the, the vibrancy of the oral tradition. As a Druid, our tradition is oral, and now it's written, but it's primarily oral. The same with Tibetan Buddhism, it's oral, but it was also telepathic, as um, you know, has been studied by Tibetan Buddhist scholars. The, the tantric teachings were mind only, mind to mind, okay? And it's the same with the Kabbalah, and it's the same with Druidry. Um, also, we have to factor in the fact that in the Kabbalah, <clears throat> they believe in reincarnation, so Moses de Leon probably was a Kabbalah teacher in many lifetimes. You know, He was bringing knowledge with him from the past to this life in Spain. Um, and then we can also factor in that for the Kabbalists, these advanced meditators, they can so channel into the higher spheres, Keta and so on, that they can, they can contact the spirits of Moses or uh, Isaiah or you know, Abraham in a kind of out-of-body trance state, which was practiced by Abraham Abulafia, a great Kabbalistic sage, living around the same time as Moses de Leon, and who was called the ecstatic Kabbalist. And he worked a lot with letters and sounds, which is what I do as a Druid. You know, it's the same tradition, just one in Hebrew and one in other languages. Um, <clears throat> so I think Moses de Leon had access not only to oral traditions, but also what we call transpersonal or supernatural traditions. And any advanced meditator can, can access the... Any really seriously advanced meditator can access those realms, because that's our duty is to converse. You see, in the Anglican tradition, we talk about the communion of saints. I love that part of the, the creed, and it's explained in the 39 articles. It's the most important part to me of the whole faith, because we don't have to do this alone. Enlightenment is not a solitary pursuit. Yes, it's good to have solitary times. You know, I went off into my cave for four years, in Canada, I lived in isolation, alone, surrounded by books, uh, you know, completely celibate, totally without, <coughs> um, you know, the, uh, allowing the other beloved in. Um, and that's very important. We should all have that time in the desert or up the mountain or whatever. But um, ultimately, Spiritual Enlightened is a communal community project. The Buddha has to then come down from the tree enlightenment place back to the village. Socrates and Plato, you know, talk about the enlightenment that comes when you get out of the cave. You then have to go back into the cave and teach your fellows how to see the same light. Um, that's what academia is all about. So um, I think what, what Moses de Leon did was he downloaded that incredible wisdom and then he was able to put it into the structure of the Zohar using the wisdom that he downloaded from those transpersonal realms. Um, anyway, scholars will study this for years to come, and it's, it's really important. Every good, pious, educated Jewish household has a copy of the Zohar, which means the brilliance, the, the light, <coughs> as well as the Bible. And most non-Jews haven't got a clue. They don't realize that this is the secret essence or wisdom inside Judaism. Poor old Hitler and the Nazis hadn't got a clue. They, they were such conspiratorial idiots that they didn't realise the wisdom that the Jews actually represent. Instead of trying to kill them all, they should have been learning and sitting at their feet and, and comparing the runes and the Kabbalah and seeing that they all come from a common source. I mean, Martin Buber and the, the great sages of Germany at the time knew that. Um, Rabbi Albert Friedlander, who was one of my mentors, uh, who worked with um, Leo Beck, who was his mentor. Leo Beck was the Grand Rabbi of Berlin in the run-up to the Nazi era and into the first few years of it, um, who was then stuck in Theresienstadt concentration camp. Um, and he survived by running philosophy seminars. Leo Beck then came to London and set up a college for progressive Judaism, you know, where, where you can integrate all world wisdom with Judaism. It's the kind of Judaism that, that I think is the most progressive. It's where uh, Lionel Blue and other great rabbis have trained. And um, Albert Friedland was Dean of Studies there, and one of my best friends in London when I was teaching there. 
And these people know the, the, <clears throat> the universalism that Judaism is actually about. Right? It's not, this is the problem with, I suppose, some elements in Israel. They've tried to turn Judaism into a sort of nationalist thing that, that has an army and wants to conquer more territory and has an intelligence agent and kills people in secret and bombs other countries. You know, Judaism isn't supposed to be about that. That's why the religious Jews don't really like serving in the army and doing warfare and being like a normal nation. Israel isn't supposed to be a normal nation. It's supposed to be a, a, a nation under God, um, dedicated to that universal vision that Moses saw up the mountain and that Moses de Leon transmitted again in the 1200s. Um, and so, yes... There's a struggle going on inside Israel between the universalists, the genuine Kabbalists, the seers, and the narrow-minded nationalists who just want to be a better, better at being a nation than anyone else. And of course, they're very good at it. You know, they can be very scarily successful in militarism and, and intelligence operations and Mossad-type skullduggery. But come on, folks, that's not what Israel's supposed to be about. Moses would be having a heart attack if he knew that's what they'd done to his faith. And so with Abraham, who was always trotting about, Abraham was an internationalist, right? He loved Egypt, he loved uh, he loved Haran, you know, he was a, he was a globalist. Um, you know, you can't stick him in a little patch and say, this is, this is all you've got, mate. <clears throat> no, he would have loved the European Union because he can roam about freely, and that's what Abraham liked doing. The same with Moses. And that's why... You know, most of my intelligent Jewish friends that I know are all pro the European Union. It's a great thing. Um, let's let's keep it going, folks. And whether you're, you know, teaching at a synagogue in Glasgow where I've been, or you want to go down to Girona where there's a great tradition of the Kabbalah in, in Spain there, or across to Prague or Paris or Berlin, you know, this this is all. It's all one offering for the gods, and for wisdom. So that's really what I want to share about Moses de Leon. <clears throat> There's a lot more I could say, but I've recorded in my... What I'm doing at the moment is a calendar of the Universal Saints and Sages for each day. And this will be eventually 365 days of teaching, which I'm going to put on my Green University website. It's already there. And if anyone wants much more detail on, on, on Moses de Leon, the Kabbalah, and each saint of the day... Um, You'll find it on the Green University website. I want to move now to look at the second great sage of today, who I'm you know, particularly fond of <clears throat> and have been for many years, and that's um, a Scotsman called Michael Scott, who um, I've had a long history of interconnections with Michael Scott. Um, he lived from 1217 to 1240. He was a Christian. Um, born in Scotland in the late 12th century, um, <clears throat> and um, probably born, you know, 1190s or whatever. Um, he spent most of his life in, or a lot of his life, in Toledo, in Spain. He went there <clears throat> after his academic studies were finished. I think he studied at Oxford and then Paris. He then went to Toledo in Spain, which was the great translation school. The Christian monarch... Um, had authorised a translation work going on between Jewish writings, Islamic writings and Christian writings, and the pagan writings of Latin and Greek. And he had translators working away, and Michael Scott joined them, and he learned Hebrew, Arabic. He already knew Latin, of course. And he started translating, for instance, um, Aristotle's Treatise on the Animals into Latin, about 1220 first time anyone had ever done this. He started translating a great Islamic writing on the Book of Astronomy, on the spheres, from al Bitrogi in 1217. <coughs> and he became quite popular among the, the, uh, you know, the Catholic intellectuals of the day, and they offered him even that he should become an archbishop in Ireland. But he turned them down in 1225. He, he was so in love with his translation and teaching work that he didn't want to just be an archbishop. You know, it's administrative, it's a bit boring. Um, so <coughs> he then translated a work by Aristotle on the heaven and the earth. Um, and then he translated certain works 
further works by Aristotle from Arabic. All this is translations from Arabic, right? Along with their commentaries done by Arabic philosophers, people like Ibn Rushd, who was the great Islamic philosopher of Cordoba, whose feet I've you know, said many a prayer when I've been visiting in Cordoba. Um, and then, so he, he was particularly interested in the works of Ibn Rushd. Um, he then was kind of headhunted by the emperor, Frederick II, who was, who was probably the greatest of all the Holy Roman emperors. He was a polymath, um, intellectual, a, a genius of his, in his own right who had in his court in Palermo in Sicily an amazing bunch of intellectuals who were both Jewish, Christian, Islamic. And every, you know, everyone was welcome to share the banquet of wisdom. You see, a true emperor like Augustus or Akbar or um, you know, Ashoka, true emperors love wisdom. I mean, like in his own little way, Kennedy, the, the great president, was a sort of a... Well, he was a lover of intellectual activity, and he, that's why he invited all the Nobel Prize winners of America to come to dinner at the White House. I mean, what a, what a gesture. Can you see Trump doing that? I think they'd, ret they'd refuse to go, to be honest. Um, <coughs> so the emperor, Frederick II, had in his court all these geniuses who were working away on sharing the wisdom of each of their traditions, right, be it Islamic, Jewish, or Christian, or whatever. And so, in a sense, they were pre-runners of my universal calendar of saints and sages, right? If Frederick had lived long enough, you know, he would, he would commission such a work, um, and he would have got his scholars working on it. Um, so what Michael Scott did there was he was appointed official astrologer to the emperor, because amongst his many other talents, he was a great astrologer. Now, and he wrote the Liber Introductorius, which is a general survey of the whole science of astrology in Latin. And then he did a smaller one for the average you know, person, the Liber Particularis, uh, which was intended for popular use. Why astrology? I mean, nobody takes that seriously, do they? Well, I'm not so sure about that, because <clears throat> certainly in the medieval times we're talking about, Astrology was a very highly developed science, and it's really the science of synchronicity. Because if you take the view that everything is interconnected, as I do, as, as in the Kabbalah and the wisdom traditions of the universal tradition, that everything that exists exists in a sort of divine complementarity. My actions influence other people. Other people's actions influence. We're all in a ripple effect. As I think purified transcendental, wise, loving thoughts, that hopefully ripples out and other people feel the same, you know. And, and I only can do that because I've sat at the feet of many great teachers, <clears throat> probably over many lifetimes, and, you know, cultivated the highest avenues that the human intellect is capable of pursuing. You know, I've travelled up to that ketosphere on occasion. And um, so... The heavens above show a synchronistic complementarity with events in our lives. Our lives are troubled, complex, difficult, challenging, full of conflict, full of balancing this and that, you know. The heavens show, it's like a sort of mathematical source book, like the code, if you want. You know, you, when you're on the computer, you can click the wrong button and suddenly the code comes up for what you're write, writing. Well, that's the code up there according to astrology, you can actually see what's going on here by studying the, the, the divine integers of the heavens. How it works, I don't have a clue. I asked um, <laughs> one of the greatest British astrologers, um, <clears throat> uh, now unfortunately dead, once at a camp, you know, we had a discussion about how it worked, and he said, look, I don't have a clue. My, um, Jonathan Cainer was his name probably the best astrologer in Britain at the time, he said, I don't know how it works, but I know it works. <laughs> and so, okay, you know, um, I'm interested in the how as a philosopher, as I think Michael Scott was. And uh, one of my unfinished books is on the astrology of war and peace. Nobody's ever attempted it. It'd be lovely to see it done. But anyway, this man, Michael Scott, was fascinated by the synchronization that happens between the events of the heavens and the events on earth, and how they seem to mirror each other. 
And they do seem to mirror each other. That's the weird thing. And it also, there are different nuances, whether it's Chinese astrology or Hindu or Mayan. You know, they all, their attempts at decoding the code of these synchronistic, uh, synchronistic events. John Dee, of course, later, the astrologer to Queen Elizabeth I, was inspired by Michael Scott's work. He had copies of his books in his library at Mortlake. <coughs> Michael Scott then also wrote, um, at the request of the emperor, Physiognomia, a general handbook of physiological medicine and science, uh, because he was interested in how the body works, you know, what's the esoteric uh, studies that we can do about, about the nervous system, the, the function of thought, and so on. Um, and these, the, at the court in Palermo, there, there was a great sharing of medical work going on between the different branches of, of thought. Um, <clears throat> Montpellier was the great French university of advanced medical science, which was partly founded by Islamic medical doctors from, from Spain. Um, he then, he did other works. Um, he wrote also a book on alchemy, the art of alchemy which he'd studied with Jews and Muslims in Spain and also from North Africa, Morocco. And it's thought he also translated Maimonides' Guide of the Perplexed, the great Jewish text, into Latin. So, now this was, now you see, <clears throat> he was a genuine polymath, a true intellectual, um, and he was fated and respected in the court. Uh, but dear old Dante consigns him to hell as a magician. <laughs> in his inferno, Dante has the cheek to stick Michael Scott in hell. Well, bless him, I think Dante thereby shows up his own ignorance, because Dante, for all his bombast and rhetoric and brilliance, is, at the end of the day, sort of peddling a line. You know, these guys are saved, these guys are damned. I don't think heaven and hell are quite like that. I think we need to rethink that cosmology, Mr. Dante, and he shows up the, you know, the era in which he was, which was, yeah, I mean, I love it. It's, it's great. It's there on the, the wall of the Sistine Chapel in The Last Judgment of Michelangelo, which shows the same dualistic kind of uh, world view. But my, my vision of heaven and hell is a bit more nuanced. It's a bit more Buddhist, a bit more Gnostic. I think the souls in incarnation at any one time, in any one plane of being, are all constantly learning. The whole thing is a school for souls. I don't think there's any part of so-called hell where they're not able to progress upwards. There's some learning possible. Um, and I suppose that makes me theologically what's called a universalist. But then, to me, so was Christ, so was Buddha, so was any saint worth their salt in the Book of Sages. Because if you're not a universalist, it means that you're shutting some people down to eternal damnation and hell forever and I can't accept that notion that's the notion that they used in the Spanish Inquisition to torture and kill non-Catholics whether Jewish or pagan or witches or whatever and it's the same notion that was used to kill and persecute the Cathars uh, in the hor horrendous crusade against them culminating in the siege of Montsegur in 1244 you know because that absolutism denied the universalism of the Cathars who believed in reincarnation and were like latter-day Gnostics um, you know so that's why I set up the Mary Magdalene Studies Association and have had conferences down in the Pyrenees to try and get to the bottom of this and I'm, I'm a universalist salvationist I believe that by working together we can get out of even hell you know this was Sartre's point as a philosopher um, that, that 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 you know the horrors of, of the Nazi era, that, that horrendous holocaust that was going on. You have to come together and join the resistance. You have to stand up for truth and love and beauty, in spite of those people over there that are listening in and trying to kill you. You know, um, Where I'm speaking from, in the middle of France, there was a resistance movement here. It was dangerous, because the Nazis ran this village for a time, but people had bravery. I've met an old widow in the village whose boyfriend, later her husband, was a young boy, you know, in the resistance movement, hiding in the woods. Um, intellectually, that's what we have to do against Brexit, because it's the new form of this neo-fascism. 
Michael Scott is one of my intellectual heroes, as you probably gathered, <clears throat> because of his polymathic nature, because of his universalism, because of his commitment to truth, and because of his internationalism. And that court of Frederick II was a jewel in which that internationalism and that interreligious dialogue was made possible. My colleagues in the World Conference on Religion and Peace have just had their big meeting in, in Lindau in Germany. I wasn't able to go, but we've elected a new Secretary General to replace Bill Vendley, who was my colleague when I was Secretary General for the UK and Ireland back in the 90s. Finally, Bill Vendley stepped down. We now have a woman Muslim professor from Amsterdam who's taken over that role, and I wish her well in that, that mission. And I hope that that group will continue to sponsor high-level theological and philosophical debate as it used to do at its best, and as I've tried to do with philosophers of peace. That's like reviving the traditions of, you know, Frederick II in Palermo, and which were going on in Toledo and other places. <clears throat> we, have to, we have to replace the monologue of nationalism and, and triumphalist nationalism. You know, there's nothing wrong with authentic, integral enlightened nationalism, like I would say the SNP represents, or, uh, you know, Plaid Cymru. These are peace-loving, integral internationalist nationalist movements, um, like Willem Davies in Wales was promoting, or Lord Davies of Landinam, who was a great internationalist, but a lover of Wales, as I am. Um, <clears throat> no, what I'm talking about is, is the kind of nationalism that hates the other, that demonises the other, be it a Muslim or whatever and that is prepared to generate people that will go and kill and shoot, and, you know, these neo-Nazi kind of killers that are roaming up on the internet, because they're just not educated, they're miseducated into thinking that's okay behaviour in our modern world. Sorry, folks, it's not. And the people that are promoting Brexit the most are the most inclined to hold those views. That's why they need opposing and, and educating. So what is it that does that well? What is the tradition that Michael Scott stood for, that the Zohar stood for, Moses de Leon? Well, you know, ultimately it's called liberalism. <laughs> what, what emerged out of this incredible narrative of, of, of mind, working with mind to find truth, was a recognition that we'd be better doing this together. We should therefore have equal rights, like freedom of speech, freedom not to be arrested. You know, there's a few centuries ago, I'd be arrested for, for my talks and uh, discussions, you know, um, as a heretic or I don't know what, you know, subversive, because I'm an educator and, and education was seen as subversive unless it had some official authority stamp behind it. Um, <clears throat> well, the tradition that believes in education as a right and duty in and of itself, as a good is what, generally speaking, is what we call liberalism, which meant um, the, the tradition that leads to liberty and freedom and liberation, ultimately. Liberalism is, the, is the, the political tool of liberation, if you want. Now, you can be Buddha under a tree just meditating and saying, cool, let's just hang out and reach enlightenment. But then you have to get up and do something. <clears throat> and... Um, Marianne Williamson gave a brilliant talk recently when she said that, uh, you know, if you keep giving money to beggars and you keep wondering why there are so many beggars, eventually you realise there's a problem with the system and you can't, like, just give money to every beggar individually. You need to change the system. Well, that's what liberalism tried to do. And, and it started by giving people the vote. <clears throat> it started by having a constitutional government. It started by writing constitutions down. It started by having a constitutional monarchy in Britain. It started with um, freeing slaves. It started with the liberation of the slaves in the 1832 Liberal government in Britain. And it started with the whole swathe of progressive legislation that, that gave rights to the working classes of the newly industrialised economy of Britain. Um, it, it tried to balance the needs of the factory owners and the manufacturers the, you know, with the rights and needs of the workers and so on. Okay, so that's really what liberal democracy has come from. That's its roots. <clears throat> and the idea was to marry 
liberty, equality, and fraternity, which is the French idea, but then to add the fourth thing, which is intelligence. There's no point having liberty, equality, and fraternity if it leads to the totalitarian rule of the guillotine. <clears throat> There's no point at all. Might as well stick with constitutional monarchy or... You know, I'd rather have Louis XIV than have my head chopped off as a thinker. At least Louis quite liked intellectuals. Um, no, let's, let's add the fourth thing. Now, this has never really been tried. <clears throat> there was a French thinker at the time, La Ponnière, who said, I'm quoting him, he said, look, we've never tried to add intelligence into the trinity of liberty, equality and fraternity. Uh, I still think Macron should see how it would go down in Parliament if he suggested oh, woe is me, that we add that word to all the places in France where you have the Trinity written up. It's on all the town halls of France. Um, <clears throat> what would happen if we add intelligence? Well, gosh, <laughs> we'd put education at the top of our spending priorities. We'd backscale the military stuff. We'd have peace policy at number one of our foreign policy. I mean, I notice Macron is, is quite rightly grumbling at what Erdogan's doing against Syria. Of course... It's outrageous what this man is doing. Erdogan is semi-educated. He's a brute. How dare he squash these Kurdish, you know, noble people that have been in that Kurdistan for millennia. They go back to the ancient Zoroastrians there. And they have a right to defend themselves. And, and this man has no right to do what he's doing. So Macron, you know, jumping up and down, saying stop. Even Trump apparently is threatening sanctions. But the problem is intelligence foresees this happening. So Trump wouldn't have withdrawn the American special forces that were protecting them because, oh dear, he'll see it's going to happen. You know, I mean, <clears throat> so putting intelligence into the trinity of liberty, equality, and fraternity would transform our politics. It would mean war would vanish. We could solve the problems of poverty because we would learn how to distribute the wealth and the genius that creates the wealth we give every kid a brilliant education to empower them to become tomorrow's geniuses. You know, that's what Marion Williamson keeps saying, jumping up and down. I couldn't agree more, madam. Um, <clears throat> I'm very proud of the fact that also around the corner from where I live in Boussac, which is a beautiful, undiscovered little sleepy town in the middle of France, <clears throat> is one of the sages of that period, uh, who was the mayor of the town in 1848, called Pierre Leroux. <clears throat> he lived from 1797 to 1871, and he was a, <clears throat> a philosopher and um, a sage, and uh, one of the first people to talk about socialism. He wrote what is thought to have been the first critical study of the meaning of the word socialist. Um, <clears throat> and he was a printer as a trade, and he published lots of journals. He, he, he had a newspaper that was the organ of the saint Simonians for a time. Um, <clears throat> and then he, he wrote a, a treatise called On Humanity, which is a full exposition of a system published in 1840. Now, this is my local sage who lived around the corner in Boussac. Um, <clears throat> he worked with George Sand, the great novelist, who was the French romantic female equivalent of Victor Hugo, and was a friend of Hugo, she lived up the road in La Chatte. And they, <clears throat> they had a, a, a brief wisdom affair, in fact, which is one of the great romantic stories of French history, really. Um, he, <clears throat> he was elected mayor in Boussac in 1848 when the revolution happened. And he was elected as a member of the Constituent Assembly in Paris. Um, and then he was elected in 9, 1849 to become a member of the Legislative Assembly, which was like the Parliament at the time. <clears throat> Unfortunately, there was a coup d'état in 1851, and um, he, he went into exile in London, <clears throat> and then settled in Jersey, and eventually in Switzerland. But the point I want to come to about LaRue is he was trying to think, how can we add intelligence into the mix of 